Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for standing by. And welcome to today's Westport webinar, Making the Shift to Natural Gas, Best Practices for Fleets. If you experience any technical difficulties joining the WebEx session today, you can contact WebEx support at 1-866-229-3239. During today's presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. However, you can submit written questions at any time by going to the Q&A panel in the lower right corner of your screen. Type your question in the space provided and click on the Send button. We encourage you to submit questions at any time during today's presentation and your questions will not be viewable by other attendees. Please be sure to direct your question to the default setting, which is All Panelists. Your host today is Nicole Adams, Communications Director at Westport. I would now like to turn the conference over to Nicole. Thank you, Nathan, and thanks everyone for joining us for Making the Shift to Natural Gas, Best Practices for Fleets. As Nathan mentioned, I'm Nicole Adams, Communications Director at Westport, and I'll be your moderator today. Our speaker today is Konrad Komietzki, Senior Director of Operations at Westport. As more and more fleets across North America are switching to natural gas, fleet operators and managers have questions about how to best prepare their facilities and teams for the shift. In this webinar, we'll help you understand the operational requirements that will give you the information you need to put together an action plan for shifting your fleet. As our WebEx host Nathan mentioned, please write your questions in the Q&A panel and Conrad will answer them at the end of his presentation. In case you missed anything during the presentation, it will be recorded and available on the Westport website in the next day or two. I'd also like to invite you to register for our upcoming webinar on October 10th, Building Your Business Plan for Natural Gas Vehicles, a case study. Registration details are available on the Westport website. I'd like to take a moment to introduce Conrad. He's responsible for all aspects of operations for the Westport heavy-duty truck business, including manufacturing and aftermarket, which is service, warranty, service engineering activities. His team have been helping customers with the transition of fleets to natural gas for over 12 years, and he's been involved in the demonstration and commercialization of Westport high-pressure direct injection technology from the very beginning. Today, the Westport service and operations team serve customers and dealers across North America and Australia on a daily basis. They've trained more than 600 technicians and supported Westport HPDI-powered trucks over 100 million miles. I'd now like to turn the presentation to Conrad. Thank you, Nicole, and good morning, everybody. So in our last webinar entitled uh, LNG and CNG, What's Best for Your Fleet, uh, my colleagues John and uh, James uh, talked to you about choosing the right fuel for your application and some of the differences between uh, LNG and CNG. And today I'd like to talk about uh, best practices uh, regardless of the fuel choice that you make. So what we're going to cover today are some of the topics you see on the screen, including fuel type, a little bit of a recap of how this choice may impact your operations, and uh, some points on how to best prepare your fleet uh, with this choice of fuel. We'll look at the operational considerations, such as fleet logistics, uh, interacting with your community and your partners and customers, as well as looking at training and who and how and when. Next, we'll look at some maintenance and repair considerations and really preparing for a successful natural gas program within your fleet. And lastly, we'll close off with some facility requirements uh, looking at typical installation requirements around the country happening today. I've also prepared a couple of case studies, which I hope you'll find interesting. One is on aftermarket installations and some of the uh, do's and don'ts, as well as giving some practical examples of uh, facilities around the country that have uh, switched to natural gas uh, maintenance and repair. We've also included some resources uh, at the end of the presentation to help you with your further research. So let's get started. So first, uh, I'd like to do a brief recap of the properties of LNG and CNG, which is an important element in your fleet preparation. So CNG, or compressed natural gas, and LNG, or liquid natural gas, are just simply two different ways natural gas is stored. Uh, it's not really the engine type that differentiates LNG and CNG. It's really how the fuel is stored on the vehicle itself. So both are delivered to the engine as, as gas. 
Uh, and remember, there's no such thing as an LNG engine or a CNG engine. You do have choice in the fuel system often. So my colleagues also talked about some factors of an informed fuel decision in our last webinar. They spoke about vehicle type and applications, uh, the differences and advantages of CNG and LNG uh, powered vehicles, uh, how you would need to consider duty cycle in your fleet, things like range, speed, idle time, uh, looking at the combined weight of your payloads, and if factoring in the storage, the storage tank weights into your total weights, the hours of service, things like drive and idle and downtime, including maintenance, and then looking at fuel costs, uh, savings versus diesel and gasoline. What I'd like to do today is focus really uh, on the last two to start our presentation, the fleet fueling needs and the fueling infrastructure available to you. So there's a couple of considerations when you look at fuel type uh, for either LNG or CNG. One is obviously the location of the fuel station with relative to your route, and the other one is fueling personnel. So really on the first one, what you need to consider and ask yourself the question is, is how is your equipment going to interact with the fueling station? Is the station public or private? Uh, does it impact on your route length? Uh, is there potentially a backup plan or, or alternate uh, within your fleet? And how does it impact on your maintenance and repairs, uh, both scheduled and unscheduled? And is your equipment available in a bi-fuel or is it a dedicated uh, natural gas vehicle? Uh, next on the fueling personnel, the question really is how are your people going to interact with the refueling? Is the station self-serve or full-serve? Uh, again, training is not difficult, uh, but you may, it may be a factor depending on the structure of your workforce, the size of your fleet, and perhaps maybe if assets are not assigned to drivers on a regular basis. So talk to your fuel provider. They can certainly help recommend some of the solutions here. So next, let's cover off some basic properties of LNG and CNG. Um, LNG, or liquid natural gas, is stored or has a boiling point near negative 260 degrees Fahrenheit or negative 160 degrees Celsius at atmospheric pressures. It's cryogenic, that means it's extremely cold. It's typically non-odorized and extra protective, uh, protective equipment is required or PPE for refueling. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, there's some additional training required because of this uh, protective equipment and, and the cryogenic side of LNG, and, but it typically rewards us with a shorter fueling time equivalent to diesel. CNG, or compressed natural gas, is a warm gas at extremely high pressures, typically uh, up to 3600 psi is the North American standard. It is typically a longer fueling time, at least for heavy duty vehicles, and is likely odorized uh, because it's typically derived from pipeline natural gas. And when, when it is derived from LNG, uh, ethyl mercaptan or the odorizer is added to it during the process. So next, uh, as my colleagues discussed, uh, you can see that more and more LNG and CNG stations open up uh, almost every month and, and the network is growing quite rapidly. So the map in front of you is, is not the complete picture of the activity that's going on. It's just to simply show that there is a lot of choice starting uh, to be available to you. So therefore you may have some choices uh, on your route. Uh, you may have public or private choices. Uh, potentially mobile refueling may be available if the public or private is not something you're looking at. And you might have the flexibility of having multiple points along your route. So plan those things with your fuel provider uh, before, you, uh, before you settle on anything. If your choices are limited in the area that you are, uh, look at the mobile fueling option as a, as a potential bridge to having a, a station uh, and also a station may be planned soon in your area if others are also interested. So talk to your fuel provider.
In the operations considerations, there's a wide number of topics to consider, but I'd like to talk about three specific ones today. They're logistics, uh, things uh, you might need to explore and how they have impact on your operations. Thinking about your partners and the greater community you operate in, uh, partners such as vendors, customers, and the larger community. How do they interact with your equipment? And then lastly, looking at some of the training aspects as they relate to operations. Who do you train? How much do you train? How much do you repeat training? Most training is focused on safety or product knowledge, but you can also use it as a buy-in throughout your organization to convert your fleet to natural gas. So let's look at logistics first. So the first thing to look in logistics is obviously the operating range of your fleet. Um, uh, is it different than it is than what you're planning and than what it is right now? Uh, do you need added flexibility? Uh, I would urge that you would plan your tank sizing appropriately with your uh, with your dealer or manufacturer, and understanding the the, diff the different sizing of LNG uh, and CNG tanks available to you today. As an example. Uh, uh, a 120 gallon LNG tank will hold about 55 gallons of diesel equivalent gallons. So don't just trust the numbers, do the math appropriately to understand the sizing and your route requirements. When you're looking at fueling infrastructure, are there fuel stops on your route or are they off the route? Uh, how many fuel islands do they have um, for, to serve your fleet? Again, is it self-serve or full-serve to consider the training aspect uh, of your drivers? Refueling times for LNG are relatively quick and CNG can take longer uh, depending on the system you use. So consider that in your, in your complete uh, picture of, of the uptime. And also, do they contain additional fueling services such as diesel exhaust fluid, uh, diesel fuel, gasoline at the same location? You may need it for other, uh, other equipment on your truck or, or, uh, or car, such as auxiliary equipment or uh, heavy truck use. Um, and then lastly, how does the maintenance and repair uh, impact uh, around, how will, it, how will the location of the fuel impact your, your downtime? Uh, remember, if a piece of equipment is down, uh, especially on an LNG side, uh, LNG is per perishable after about seven days. CNG can be stored indefinitely, however. So those are some of the considerations you should be thinking about and, and the impact on your logistics. Let's move on to your partners and community. I think this is a topic that uh, often gets overlooked until uh, later on in the process of rolling out a natural gas fleet. And uh, I think it's important to involve the appropriate people within your organization and identify the key areas that may need to be addressed. Think through how your customers will interact and respond to natural gas vehicles in their fleet. For example, are you parking uh, potentially indoors in their facility and may need to work through a plan uh, for natural gas vehicles? Or maybe you're utilizing equipment on their site uh, that may cause uh, some extra training on, on their end. You, you likely have some existing vendors, people like tire suppliers and body shops and maintenance providers who will need to be trained or made aware of the natural gas choice that you're making. And you likely uh, gain some new vendors such as CNG inspectors or obviously your fuel provider. Uh, so work with them together to, to figure out a plan, uh, both for training and some of the logistics I talked about. Next is your local authorities and first responders. Um, often in smaller communities, uh, they will need to be notified that you're planning a natural gas fleet and uh, so that they can prepare adequately. Uh, are they trained in, in responding to uh, natural gas vehicle accidents, uh, etc.? So this is a good thing to reach out to. <clears throat> you, of course, have some outreach opportunities when switching to natural gas things like environmental responsibility or usage of domestic fuel and some of the education and, and creating examples around your community. So uh, think through those options. So let's move on to training. Training comes in different forms and types. Uh, typically you'll start off with basic fuel training both for CNG and LNG vehicles. 
uh, potentially you may have some driver training, uh, especially in the heavy equipment side of things. There's technician training for servicing and maintenance of your vehicles, general staff training, uh, basic knowledge of your, of your administrative staff in your office or yard, and uh, like I talked about, potentially outside of your company. The themes, however, uh, are basically the same. Uh, safety is number one. Emergency response and having people know what to do in case of an emergency. The use and of specialized tool and equipment such as PPE or personal protective equipment. And looking at obviously some of the operating characteristics and product specific things like range, parking considerations, warning lights or signs. So training can be broken up into the various pieces depending on the group. So next section I'd like to cover maintenance and repair considerations. And for most fleets, this is the core of a well-run fleet is maintenance and repair planning. Some of the key considerations in, in, on this side are things like preventative maintenance, uh, coordinating schedules and looking at common maintenance items versus incremental maintenance items. Uh, things like repair planning, uh, looking at the authorized service providers in your area versus considering uh, potentially doing in-house servicing or maintenance and weighing the pros and cons of each. Uh, looking at some of the towing and parking considerations you may have when doing maintenance and repairs. The investment in tools for both natural gas specific and product specific tools. We'll touch, quickly touch on parts, uh, natural gas product specific parts versus substitutes. And obviously again training, a uh, common thread in this presentation. Where do you go for training and what's involved? So let's start with maintenance. Maintenance uh, coordination and maintenance schedules are an important thing to think through when you're deploying your natural gas fleet. Often you will have maintenance, uh, different maintenance schedules for engine, fuel system or chassis, each with their own schedule, so plan to coordinate them to optimize the uptime of your fleet. Um, looking at common maintenance items that exist also in non-natural gas applications, things like engine oil service, coolant service, hydraulic steering and hydraulic uh, driving system service, uh, spark plugs, valve adjustments and fuel filters are the same in other applications. However, consider and be careful of the differences in the application, the specification of those, of those specific maintenance items and also the interval changes as they may be quite different. And we'll go into a good example of uh, spark plugs uh, later on uh, in our parts, uh, parts section. You'll also have some incremental maintenance items. These are typically natural gas filters, um, storage vessel and system inspections for natural gas vehicles, uh, gas detection system inspections, and maybe some product specific items. So repair planning, as we all know, uptime is everything. So repair planning is quite critical. Um, when you're talking to your authorized service providers, uh, make sure that they're ready. Uh, do you know them? Have you done uh, work with them before? And are they prepared for your needs? Uh, remember, the, the challenges you're experiencing on, your, uh, on the integration of your natural gas fleet, they'll likely be experiencing similar things. So set expectations early with them so that there is a clear line of communication of what's going to happen. Are you relying on a larger service network along your route? Um, it's an important consideration that has to, be, uh, has to be thought of ahead of time. If you plan to do some in-house servicing, um, you have to make sure that you have service materials and, and resources available for your technician and maintenance personnel. Do they have the correct technical assistance? Um, where can they turn for questions? Usually it's a training provider but maybe there's a regional representative in your area that can help train them and answer some questions. And if you do plan to do some warranty, uh, have a plan with your dealer or your manufacturer uh, to make sure that that is, uh, that that is something that's allowed. Next on towing and parking considerations. Obviously, uh, natural gas vehicles should not be parked in enclosed spaces unless, uh, unless the shop is equipped properly. 
and things like fuel leaks and safety are important considerations. Uh, other considerations you may have are things like uh, paint booths and garages for collision repairs and inspections uh, or custom applications and, and specific modifications. There's some good codes that I've provided in the resources page that should help you answer some of these questions. But again, it's similar to involving your vendors and your customers. Think through the other considerations of how your fleet interacts with these, with these other providers. Next, let's touch on some service tools. So obviously, if you're going to do some service, and some investment is required in the tooling service, you're going to have some natural gas specific tools that are um, typically applicable to any natural gas vehicle, CNG or LNG. Things like gas detection uh, could be either fluid or electronic. Um, uh, many natural gas vehicles utilize compression fittings. Uh, so gauges and guides are what's used in order to, uh, uh, to correctly install the fittings if they're taken apart or they need to be made up from new. Uh, some sort of fuel transfer apparatus for both draining, filling and transferring CNG or LNG. Gas detection testing equipment and obviously your personal protective equipment as it relates to LNG. You may also need some product specific tools such as electronic tools for engine and fuel system uh, calibration or some off engine specialty equipment such as vacuum, drain fill or handling equipment to install the components. So uh, talk to your service provider about uh, getting some of this equipment if you're interested. Next a quick word on parts. Um, just a quick recap, CNG uh, has obviously high pressures and, and lubrication is slightly different. Um, LNG is cryogenic uh, and, uh, and therefore flexibility and durability of components uh, is important. So I would caution you to always use approved parts and never substitutes, even if they look the same, uh, from a non-natural gas uh, rated parts. This is very, very critical. Some of the good examples uh, are things like spark plugs. Spark plugs for engines, natural gas engines, are not the same uh, as spark plugs for, for regular engines, typically. Uh, watching out with things like seals or O-rings, uh, that's very, very critical when you're talking about temperatures and high pressures. Um, appropriately marked components, even between uh, natural gas systems. Make sure that your technicians are very well aware of uh, PRDs and uh, things like pressure relief valves and pressure relief devices. Uh, wrong components will have the incorrect working or bur burst pressure. So use only approved components and follow your manufacturer specifications. Next, let's look at training. Uh, I would start with a recommendation for training from your dealer or fuel provider as a best training alternative in your area. There's also some resources uh, links um, on some of the training partners you, you can see. Um, there's some product specific training obviously for engines such as uh, uh, natural gas engines, fuel systems, this is all, all the chassis mounted components, and things like electronics or standalone modules. There's also some general natural gas training like cylinder inspections uh, that you can do yourself, uh, facility outfitting, uh, fuel station uh, uh, training, fueling, um, and safety and emergency response training. I also mentioned pipe fitting if you're doing any modifications to uh, or installing some of natural gas systems. The resources available to you typically fall within manufacturers or dealers. Um, uh, people like uh, Westport, Cummins, and Ford, usually you can sign up through your local dealer or distributor. And costs vary. Most are off-site, but some can be arranged to come uh, directly to your, um, to your facility. Uh, often don't overlook local colleges. Many local colleges are transitioning to offering natural gas training or, uh, at vocational levels. So you can uh, look through your colleges, places like Long Beach City College is a good example um, that I'm aware of. Um, and also private uh, training, so, uh, places like NGBI and others, which I've listed in the resources page. 
So I think there's a lot of training resources available to you. Next, next let's look at some facility requirements. Um, basically, you have three areas that I'd like to talk about. Planning, uh, what you typically need and what you should consider when looking at uh, facilities uh, working on natural ga gas. Some regulatory considerations, including some of the most applicable codes in North America. And uh, a, a summary of some of the general equipment that I've seen uh, personally in shops around the uh, around the country. So let's look at planning. Like any project, uh, you need to develop a plan. What is the purpose of your facility? Think about uh, what the fleet size uh, that's being serviced is and what the throughput is. Uh, consider what ge geography you're in because that can play an important part in whether you can work on vehicles outside and therefore save some costs. Um, on uh, upgrading your shop if that's possible to you. Has anyone in your area maybe changed their facility and are they willing to help you? Uh, did they do it alone or did they hire help? Those are the kinds of questions I think you should be asking. Um, you need to consider whether you have some choices. Are you upgrading an existing facility or are you looking at new construction? So. Obviously, with an existing facility, you can retrofit some of the components and potentially relocate shop equipment, uh, such as heaters and lights, uh, to the appropriate location. Or you can look at some procedural changes uh, within how you handle natural gas vehicles, such as dedicating a bay, perhaps, or looking at working outside, as I mentioned. Uh, with new construction, you obviously have added flexibility to do this ahead of time, and you can choose the appropriate shop equipment, uh, and uh, such as heaters, lights, um, panels, and, and choose their location ahead of time. Next, you're going to have to work at a local level to get approval. Uh, typically, this is a fire marshal or equivalent authority in the area. And since no code exists at a national level, uh, all decisions are made at that local level. So be prepared with your plan. I would urge you to do the research ahead of time or hire somebody to do the research ahead of time uh, before you go see the fire marshal. Many of them in smaller communities, especially if this is their first time converting, may not be um, aware of all the code requirements. So it's, it's good uh, to help them. So next there's a quick summary of some of the codes and pertinent facility codes that, I, that I've uh, put together for you. The industry standard that is typically followed, again, this isn't written in stone, but typically people look at the International Code Council, fire and building codes in your area, uh, the National Fire Protection or NFPA, and specifically code 30A, I've included that in the appendix as well. And 30A is really the only standard specific to natural gas vehicle facilities, and it also includes repair and fuel dispensing um, guidance. So copies of these codes are typically available through the websites for um, and organizations for a, a specific fee. So look them up. Uh, additional codes relative to natural gas vehicles are things like NFPA um, 52 is a, is a good one, 57. Uh, these are fuel system installation and parking structure requirements. Uh, for those of us in Canada, such as Canadian Standards Association or CSA, um, follow similar logic. And there's also some codes on fuel system installations for SAE. Now, NFPA 52 is, is also an important code relative to the installation and maintenance of natural gas systems on a vehicle. And uh, I would urge you that any technicians working on natural gas vehicles um, should follow the standard, especially if they're doing any component installation and inspection. Uh, if you're doing any custom work or fabrication in the aftermarket um, or are having to uh, retrofit vehicles uh, for, for a different purpose, this is a, this is a critical code to understand by your technicians. And actually one of my examples in the case study talks about a successful um, case study where a technician was quite aware of this code. So let's look at some general uh, equipment for a workshop that people typically do. Now, this is not a guideline of uh, what you should do, but this is just what I've seen around the country, so I thought I'd share it with you. 
most of the following information, however, is specifically applies to LNG-fueled vehicles. This is because LNG is not odorized, and vessels that contain LNG typically have pressure relief valves that will automatically relieve pressure in the LNG. Remember, LNG is constantly trying to change state from liquid to gas, and therefore rising in pressure. Uh, CNG tanks obviously also contain pressure relief valves or pressure relief devices and excess flow valves. However, they can typically hold CNG indefinitely unless exposed to really extreme temperatures. So, in any case, if the potential for release of natural gas exists uh, and, and similar hazards such as ignition exist and, and displacement of oxygen, it's a good idea to, to look at uh, shop safety uh, from that aspect. So I consider LNG as the most complete case or sort of the most extreme case when dealing with uh, natural gas vehicles. And, and always, if in doubt, uh, you can simply defuel the vehicle and work on it in, in any shop available to you. So let's look at uh, some of the three primary things such as gas detection, ignition source mitigation, and ventilation. So first off, I'll start off with gas detection. And again, this is more of a requirement for uh, liquid natural gas, which is non-odorized. The odorant, uh, ethyl mercaptan, um, does not mix in cryogenic temperatures, so therefore natural gas is naturally not odorized. Um, CNG, is, it, is, it, it is odorized, therefore you typically don't need gas detection. However, um, there have been cases where CNG has not been odorized when it's made from LNG, but typically the standard is, is that it is, uh, it is odorized. So different considerations to make when you're outfitting your facility. Uh, again, each local authority may have a different interpretation of the codes, uh, so you need to talk to them. Um, and it's often uh, quite efficient, and what I've seen in the industry is, is shops will dedicate a specific area or bay to work on natural gas vehicles where you can install this, this detection. So quickly on gas detection, it's used primarily to detect methane. Uh, the sensors are installed at or near the ceiling because natural gas rises um, and LNG rises as it's warmed, therefore that's, when it's gonna, that's where it's going to accumulate. And these typically are equipped with an audible uh, and visual alarm and uh, often they go off, the, the standard that I've seen goes off at about 20% of the lower explosive limit uh, when, when the methane is reached. So 20% of the lower explosive limit is 20% to uh, when it's uh, mixed with air. The next uh, consideration for shops is mitigation of uh, ignition sources. So. Uh, avoid things like flame heaters uh, mounted near the ceilings or open flames or torches near a vehicle. Um, the ignition sources in those designated areas must be mitigated. mitigated. In their place you can put in things like explosion proof lighting, um, things like brushless fan motors may be used in place. Um, the best practice uh, really for doing any heavier fabrication work is to remove fuel from the vehicle altogether. Um, often a suitable power shutdown system can also be installed uh, in concert with the methane detection system to shut all of these devices off when there's an alarm. Lastly, let's cover ventilation. And this is really important. Um, as I said, natural gas is lighter than air uh, and therefore rises to the ceiling, so suitable ventilation is, is critical near the ceiling or in the designated areas. A well-ventilated roof is important because of the rapid rise, um, and some shops utilize either fume hoods or, or, um, or big uh, brushless fans to evacuate uh, natural gas in case of an emergency. Um, also, like I mentioned, you can integrate the methane detection uh, into uh, triggering, uh, uh, turning on of your vent system, uh, opening doors automatically for ventilation, or even shutting down power in the building uh, if necessary. So next, uh, lastly, let's look at some case studies. Uh, and these case studies are really uh, what I've seen in the industry and some of the examples that I've personally come across. 
in, in the last 12 years of dealing with uh, mostly heavy, nat uh, heavy duty natural gas vehicles. So what I thought I would do is give you a couple of uh, real life examples of situations that have happened. I won't name any customer names or shops, uh, but, I just, but I think it's more important to look at the lessons learned here. So let's look at the first example. This is an uh, aftermarket installation case study. Uh, a, a specific customer required uh, an, an installation of an auxiliary pump uh, driven by a PTO uh, on, on a heavy truck. Uh, this, particular, uh, this particular option is, is not uncommon in the, in the heavy duty truck world, but uh, this equipment was not available through the OEM, therefore it had to be installed by a third party. Um, when they were doing the pilot truck or the first build, it was recognized that the equipment was interfering with a specific high pressure line um, that was located near the frame rail. And, and it was recognized that this uh, plumbing would be best served if it was uh, moved because of the location of the pump and also the, the operation of, of the specific equipment. Uh, and this, uh, a customer technician who uh, was very well trained and aware of NFPA 52 recognized uh, that he should involve somebody uh, like a, a local gas inspector and really reach out to his network that he gained through the training um, to sort of get an idea of whether, uh, whether this would be possible. And it turned out that it, that it was actually a very simple modification uh, that, would, that could be done to code. Um, uh, at a third party, and it was successfully completed with, n with no additional cost. And I think this is a really good example of how very well trained technicians and knowledgeable, knowledgeable technicians uh, can be such a tremendous asset to our industry um, and, and be able to uh, not be afraid to raise their hand and, and take a look at a situation and resolve it in a very practical manner. So. Uh, Again, reach out to your network of specialists as you go forward in this industry and, and uh, ask the questions because often you might be the uh, first person that's doing it. Um, so I think this is a, a good example of, of uh, a well-trained technician and a code that's been applied. Next, I wanted to look at some specific facility case studies. Again, I want to caution that uh, each local authority has the final say in how your facility may be prepared, and every building is, is different from the next. So use um, your facility planning and then working with your local authorities to, uh, uh, to be able to uh, get the right plan in place. Um, the first one is a Canadian dealer in Quebec. Um, they have five dedicated bays, uh, methane detection monitoring, and a central ventilation um, fully cycles when the, uh, if the methane detection reaches 20% lower explosive limit and there's an alarm triggered at the same time. Similarly, a customer um, also in Quebec uh, has a dedicated bay, methane detection monitoring and isolated ventilation. Um, the uh, doors open in this case in his uh, specific facility if the uh, ventilation is reached. The next study uh, next, next slide here is uh, a dealer in British Columbia. Again, do, uh, five dedicated bays, same uh, methane detection at 20%. Um, they have a system where central, uh, they have central ventilation and doors opening if the alarm is triggered and the power is switched off in their facility. And what, what's really, I uh, hope you're seeing the commonality between uh, most of these facilities is that they again utilize um, gas detection for LNG vehicles, they utilize uh, ventilation, proper ventilation by either installing fans in the ceiling or opening doors, and they're utilizing, uh, they're mitigating their uh, potential ignition sources. So these are the common things that, that people do. Uh, a fairly large dealer in California, again I spoke about geography a little bit, uh, utilizes a different approach. They, they look at, uh, they, they're able to work on vehicles outside most of the year um, and they, they're very uh, good at uh, utilizing procedures and they have procedures in place to bring in natural gas vehicles into the shop, whether they're CNG or LNG. And they have a, uh, a procedure for defueling vehicles um, uh, when they have to have a job that's a little bit longer. So that's another approach that's potentially available to you. 
So I wanted to thank you uh, for your time today and uh, there's a resources page that we've put together with some of the uh, specific codes um, and, and resources available to you and, and some of the associations for training on the last page. So thank you very much and I'll turn it back to Nicole. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Conrad, and thank you everyone for your, your interest today. Uh, we're now going to turn the presentation over to some of your questions. We, we have a number of them. So if we're not able to get to your question today, um, please feel free to email us after the presentation at media at westport.com and you'll see that up on the screen. You can also uh, look us up online at www.westport.com. Our first question today is, uh, how long is a typical driver training? Uh, typically a driver, it really depends on the kind of system that you use, um, but driver training for, for example, a heavy duty truck is typically no more than an hour. Um, and that's the initial product familiarization, safety, walk around, um, and, and in addition to that, you, would, you could expect some refueling training as well. Uh, for CNG vehicles, it can be even shorter than that, and the focus is more on refueling the uh, vehicle rather than operation. Okay, thanks, Conrad. And how long, a similar question, how long is a typical technician training? Uh, technician training uh, varies based on what product you're using, but it's uh, generally at least a day and up to three days. Okay, thanks. Um, a, a couple of questions we have asking for a review of some of the slides and discussion. The first one is please review the CNG, LNG, uh, DGE fuel equivalent slide. And I think, was that slide number four, Conrad? Yes. Okay, I'll just scroll back to that. So bear with me, folks. There we go. No, uh, I think it's uh, slide number 10. Slide 10. There we go. Uh, it's a good question. Again, uh, as I wanted to remind, remind you, uh, natural gas uh, can be either stored as gas or liquid. So the density that you're going to have in terms of diesel equivalency really depends on which medium you have. Um, for liquid natural gas vehicles, uh, the conversion is roughly 1.7, uh, um, one gallon of diesel is equivalent to about 1.7 diesel equivalent gallons of LNG. And when it comes to CNG under the North American standard, uh, it is uh, 3.8. Uh, diesel equivalent gallons to one diesel gallon. So that's what you would use when you're sizing your tank. And I think I gave the example, um, at least on the uh, on the uh, the Westport product, uh, uh, roughly 120 gallon LNG tank will hold about roughly 55 diesel equivalent gallons of fuel, uh, plus or minus. That, that's a rough number. Um, LNG uh, depends somewhat on temperature and pressure that you're getting delivered. Um, so that, that number is, is a little bit flexible. But again, talk to your fuel provider uh, to get the exact number and, and make sure you understand that carefully when you're specking your equipment. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, another question that came up was, what happened to the discussion on spark plugs? So I'm not sure uh, if, uh, sorry, if yeah. we cut out during that. Or? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so uh, there's been instances where uh, the spark plugs on natural gas engines uh, looks very similar to the spark plugs used in, in regular gasoline engines. Uh, but all I was trying to make a point there with was that uh, use the approved numbers. Um, uh, don't just go by the size and, and, and length of the spark plugs. And this has been, uh, um, that is something very important for natural gas engines. Thanks, Conrad. Uh, the next question is, why isn't LNG odorized during production? That's a very good question. Um, uh, LNG is, uh, again, cryogenic. Um, and uh, the use of uh, the odorant that's added to LNG that we're mostly familiar with, for example, in our home, um, the, the sort of rotten egg smell that we smell is a substance called ethyl mercaptan. And ethyl mercaptan is not soluble. Um, uh, it, it cannot be used in, uh, in LNG at cryogenic temperatures. It basically freezes and drops out. So uh, LNG is not odorized. 
Um, I say typically because um, I have heard reports from customers and experienced this one time where um, uh, we, there, there was some reported smell in the LNG, but typically it is not odorized at all and CNG is odorized because it's a warm gas. Thanks, Conrad. Uh, next question is, I don't understand parking and issues around it. Can I park my natural gas vehicle in an enclosed space? No. Um, it's not a good idea to park your natural gas vehicle in an enclosed space, uh, especially an LNG vehicle, because the, um, if, an, if LNG boils off and the temperature in the tank raises, there's an automatic uh, relief valve on any LNG tank that will release uh, methane into the air. And once methane is released, it, um, uh, it, uh, it, it can gather around the roof of the building and therefore cause a, a potentially uh, dangerous situation. I did mention that CNG vehicles can hold their CNG indefinitely, so it's less of a problem, but uh, as a general rule, CNG vehicles should not be parked indoors. Thanks very much. Uh, oh, a couple of questions about the webinar itself. Will I get a copy of this presentation? Uh, will I be able to um, obtain a copy of the PowerPoint? Yes. Uh, the, the presentation uh, itself, the recording, is going to be available on the Westport website at www.westport.com. We should have that available in the next, uh, the next couple of days once we receive the recording. You can also, again, email us at media at westport.com if you would like a copy of the slides as well. We can, we can send those to you. So thanks for asking. Uh, the next question refers back to our last webinar. I couldn't attend the June webinar regarding differences between CNG and LNG. Is the presentation available on your website? Yes. It's available on the webinar section of our website. The recording and the slides are available. Also, again, if you would like a copy of the slides, uh, just the slides from that presentation, we're happy to email those to you. Just send me a line at media at westport.com and I'll make sure that you receive those. Our next question is, and I don't know um, if you can respond to this or not, Conrad, how have insurance companies reacted to shops converting or adding natural gas facilities? Yeah, unfortunately I don't, uh, I don't know, I'm not uh, aware of that situation. Okay, well Something we'll... Something we could probably answer uh, we'll, later we'll, on. We'll try to look into that. Uh, next question, it's about CNG and LNG. Is there a color to LNG or CNG flame? Yeah, it's no different than, uh, again, LNG uh, is a liquid and LNG actually doesn't burn. Um, LNG uh, needs to be converted to vapor before it can, uh, before it can burn. Similarly to CNG, um, you're really burning natural gas at a much lower pressure. Uh, the color is the same as it is in your home, uh, a gas barbecue or your stove. It's just a, a, a nice blue. Thanks, Conrad. Our next question is, are there any cost differences in facility setup and operation between hot climate areas and cold climate areas? And specifically, does humidity influence the maintenance in the facility? That's a good question. Um, I think that there is a, a, a cost difference there. Um, in cold climates, you need to worry about things like insulation, uh, heated, uh, uh, heated shop spaces, whether the shop space is heated uh, via forced air or uh, open flame heaters or maybe in-floor heating. In warmer climates, typically, um, you're not worried so much about any heat. Uh, it's mostly air conditioning. Um, so uh, I'm not sure if humidity plays a part. I don't think it, there's, I can't think of any considerations where humidity would be a factor uh, specifically for LNG or CNG. Um, but yeah, the, the, I would assume the costs in warmer climates are quite a bit less if you remove the, uh, if you remove the potential ignition sources in, in a shop. Um, you would still need a, a similar gas detection inside a facility. Uh, as well as ventilation, uh, proper ventilation. Or you could simply choose to uh, uh, build a facility that's um, outside uh, to work on the vehicle, if that was possible. Of course, some of the hotter climates, that also becomes an issue, I understand, uh, when, it, when it's too hot. But no, humidity, I don't think, plays a, 
apart. Thanks, Conrad. Uh, our next question is, you did not mention the minor repair facility versus major facility requirements. So I guess it's more of a statement than a question, but we can infer from that. Can you, can you discuss sure. the differences? Sure. Um, often, uh, and what I assume you mean here is minor repair, things like uh, maintenance, oil changes, alignments, um, that kind of a thing. Uh, versus major repairs where maybe you're taking out uh, components, uh, engine components or transmissions or whatever. So I'll answer the major one first. Um, uh, our stance has always been if you're doing any major repair in a vehicle where the vehicle is disabled for potentially an unknown amount of time, um, you know, uh, wh whether the job is a uh, few hours or something can go wrong where a part doesn't arrive on time or um, something is damaged or stripped and requires extra um, extrication or whatnot. It's always best to defuel the vehicle. That way, um, the technician can uh, work safely on the vehicle and use all of his tools like torches and, and hammers and whatnot. Um, so that one becomes uh, really more of a defueling, uh, defueling issue. If the, for example, if the major work is occurring and the timeline is relatively set, then I think you uh, can outfit the facility in a similar way that, uh, that, you would, that I mentioned, which is ventilation, gas detection, and uh, flame mitigation. For minor repairs, what many shops will do, uh, and I'll use the example of, of CNG, as a technician is advised to leak check the vehicle, um, leak check the tanks and the, and the lines, um, with uh, the proper gas detection. Usually this is uh, snoop or uh, the liquid that's used on, on the fittings as well as the electronic uh, gas sniffer or handheld gas detection before bringing the vehicle in um, and then uh, working on the vehicle and then removing it, uh, uh, you know, not leaving the vehicle ever overnight in a shop or um, finishing the, the work uh, is, that is assigned to him without uh, leaving it over an extra shift. And we've seen a similar trend in LNG vehicles as well, like trucks, um, where a, a technician will be, uh, the procedure, that's what I mentioned about the procedures, where a technician might be assigned to the job, he does a leak check on the vehicle outside, brings it in, leaves the doors open, uh, performs the maintenance or the service that's required, signs off on the vehicle and takes it outside. So we, we've seen that as well. Um, some shops also use uh, uh, vent ho hoods over the uh, vent stacks of the vehicles to uh, evacuate uh, any LNG. And again, it's around facility planning and, and having the uh, the sign off with your with your uh, local authorities to say this is my plan, this is what I'm going to do. And most of the time, when it's reasonable, it hasn't been a problem. Uh, we seem to have a follow-up question to the indoor parking, so I, I'd like to address that one if we can. Okay. It is. Uh, for example, in Minnesota, can CNG vehicles be parked indoors if the building is ventilated? And I mean in an indoor garage. Yeah, and uh, I'm not sure uh, uh, specifically about Minnesota. Um, I'm not familiar with their local laws. Um, but uh, yeah, so we would have to refer that to, uh, to the manufacturer or, or to your local authority. But like I said, uh, typically, we don't advise people leaving uh, natural gas vehicles in general indoors unattended. Um, and, and like I mentioned, CNG vehicles uh, are typically less at risk. But again, I would have, you would have to check with your local uh, fire marshal. Thanks very much. We're, um, we're running out of time, so I'm, I'm going to wrap up right now. Uh, if we haven't been able to address your question today, we did have a few more. Uh, I believe that we have everyone's contact information. However, if you don't hear from us in response to your question via email, please do follow up with us again at media at westport.com and we will get back to you as soon as we can. Again, if you'd like to share the presentation with colleagues, if you'd like to see it again, it's being recorded and it will be available on the Westport website in the next couple of days. Uh, I'd also, again, like to remind you to join us for our next webinar on October 10th, Building Your Business Plan for Natural Gas Vehicles, a Case Study. Mark Huff, who's President of TriStar Construction in Oklahoma, will share his experiences with us. And he's going to discuss the process he used to make his decision, the key resources fleets 
have available to them when they're considering the transition, useful metrics and analytics to help fleet owners evaluate financial and operating benefits, and first-hand experience in preparing drivers for the transition. Registration is free and it's available now on our website at www.westport.com in the webinar section. Well, thank you once again for your participation. We greatly appreciate having you here and we hope to have you with us again on October 10th. Have a good day. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude today's webinar. Please note that as you leave today's event, you'll be presented with a brief feedback survey. If you could take just a moment to fill that out, we would appreciate it. Once again, we thank you for your time today, and you may now disconnect.